Would you turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 22, Hebrews eleven twenty-two. 22. We're, we're in a series where we're learning about courageous faith, the, the, the courageous faith of assorted Bible heroes. We call this chapter, Hebrews 11, the Hall of Faith. And it's not every hero who ever lived, but the, uh, the Lord just uh, caused the writer to write down certain stories to build our faith, to build my faith, build your faith. Now, we've been in this for a few weeks, so I don't know if you have noticed this pattern, but I have noticed some patterns uh, among the experience of the different people, uh, these different heroes of the faith. One, they all waited. And several of them, the, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they waited for decades for the promised child that God gave them. God said, I'm giving you a, a child that is going to, to, to help kind of create this people of God, the people of Israel that I'm, I'm creating. And each of those had to wait for decades, and they had to cry out in prayer, God, heal my wife and help her to be able to, to have children. And that's, that's just a common thread I noticed. They all all of, all of the Bible heroes went through painful trials, and one of those trials was waiting. Another one, I think of Noah, and just a whole different um, scenario. He was waiting, but for, uh, for about 100 years, he was out there in the desert sun building this life-saving, humongous boat. We call it the ark. And uh, God had called him to do this. And again, he is having to wait 100 years. People lived a lot longer lives. So he was already like 500 years or so when he started. So he's waiting and working for literally decades, 10 decades. That has got to be a trial. And several of our heroes that we're reading about and, and learning from all went through mockery of their families. Can you imagine when your family or friends are mocking you for your faith and for, for, like for the steps you're taking in faith? Uh, they were all misunderstood. And so I'm noticing this theme among the people of our heroes went through painful trials. And so I was thinking about that. And I have some questions that I have been asking and I, I want to ask today and look at God's word to see what it says. I want to find some answers. One, my first question is this. Is there a connection between these crazy trials that our heroes are going through and courageous faith? Is there a connection between, between, between trials and and faith. Uh, do trials cause faith to grow? Like, is that why they come into our lives? Do, do bad things, do difficult things, do long waiting periods, hot sun, mockery, does that cause faith to grow in us? Here's another question. Is it possible to develop courageous faith without going through trials? That sounds a lot easier. In fact, do you know a very, very famous hero, Bible hero, asked the same question in a garden. Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, prayed, Father, is there any other way that I could save the world other than going to the cross? But he said, but if there isn't, I'm going I'm to do it. I'm going to obey. But is there an easier way? Then going through this huge trial, is there an easier way to become a person of courageous faith? On the flip side of that, my mind is working overtime here, can a person go through crazy trials and not develop courageous faith? Is it possible to go through really hard times even as a follower of Christ and not come out on the other side better? Is it possible? I'm going to talk about that today. So today, our next hero Oh my goodness, he, he is one of my favorite Bible characters, favorite heroes of the Bible. And his story is so long and so involved. I, I believe this is going to be part one today. There's just, I just cannot get, to, there's so much that happened to him and so much that he did that is an example for us. Joseph was a, a, a guy whose whole extended family, there was a there was a lot of them, the big family. They were forced to leave the promised land. So God had said to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I am giving you this land, the land that we now know as Israel today. They called it Canaan then. I'm giving you Canaan. 
But Joseph, who is the, who's the son of Jacob, so the, next, the fourth, fourth generation, he and his family, they were forced to leave for, at different times for different reasons. But they find themselves in Egypt. That's not God's promised land for them. And so they're, they're in Egypt, and it's the most interesting thing. God still blesses them. He blesses them, their whole family. And on his deathbed, and I, I'm, I'm skipping straight to there because in Hebrews 11, it tells us what he did on his deathbed. On his deathbed, Joseph did two things. He prophesied a blessing for the, his extended family. The family's name is Israel. Okay, so he prophesied a blessing for them. And he made a request of the family members that were gathered around him. And it's in Hebrews 11:22. It was by faith, someone say by faith. faith. It's by faith that Joseph, when he was about to die, said confidently, in other words, full of faith, that the people of Israel would leave Egypt. Now, this is very strange because they were doing great there. They were blessed. Their flocks were in, enlarging. Their family was enlarging. They had the best area of the land. Like they were doing, it was awesome. But Joseph knew there was a higher calling and God had given them a specific land. Uh, and so he, he prophesied that Israel would leave Egypt and he commanded them. We'll get to how he can do that later because he's the young son. He commanded them to take his bones with them when they left. So he's on his deathbed, and he said, God's going to get us out of Egypt, and when we go, you take my bones. He had no idea, would that be like in three weeks? When would it be? And specifically, there's a little, a, a little, a few more details in Genesis chapter 50, verse 24. He said that God will surely come to help you and lead you out of this land of Egypt. He will bring you back to the land he solemnly promised to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So that's this, this prophecy that he gave. Was it fulfilled in three weeks? Do you know? No. <laughs> 400 years. And you know uh, who was the leader? Moses. So he prophesied way before Moses came along. And God fulfilled that prophesy, prophecy. So who is this Joseph? I have a specific picture in mind uh, of what Joseph was like. And I, it's based on uh, a guy I went to high school with. It's actually, I have a guy in mind and a girl in mind from high school days. Because I looked to these two people as people who had it made. They had everything going for them. Uh, both of these people in my mind, one was the son of a, uh, a very successful construction company. The other was the daughter of a chiropractor with a very successful business in my little hometown. And they just felt, it seemed like they had every, everything going for them. They were born into a good family. They were good looking. The Bible says in Genesis 39, 6, Joseph was a very handsome and well-built young man. Man, that could have been said about me. But it was said about Joseph in this case. He's the 11th son of Jacob. What is, here's a quiz question. What's, what's the name that God gave to Jacob? Shout it out. Israel. Israel. Everyone's like, is it Israel? I think the answer is always Jesus. <laughs> but not in this case. Yeah. Jesus changed Jacob's name to Israel. Okay, yeah. So uh, Joseph is the 11th son of his of Jacob or Israel's wife Jacob or uh, Rachel Jacob's wife J Rachel and he had always wanted to have a child with Rachel and through a long complicated slightly dysfunctional uh, process he eventually he has 10 other kids 10 other sons and then finally the 11th son is Joseph born in, uh, you know of of the favorite wife spoiler alert there Rachel and in, in Jacob's mind, Joseph, little Jojo, could do no wrong. Joseph was the guy, the kid. And so Jacob, by now very wealthy guy, he commissions this beautiful robe, a coat of many colors, to be, to, to be made, custom made, and fitted to Joseph. 
So everyone around knew he got the coat. I did not. <laughs> that did not sit well with the bros. Remember, he's number 11. So the 10 older brothers did not like this so much. Unfortunately, Joseph also was a bit of a snitch. And so when the 10 bros were out there supposed to be guarding the sheep and tending the flocks, when they were messing up, when they were goofing off, when they are throwing a kegger out there, he would go, <laughs> J- Joseph would go to his dad and say, Dad, you're not going to believe what the brothers are doing, and the, the brothers would get in trouble. So, he, he, you know, he was a snitch. And so the brother's not really loving him so much at this point. On top of that, when Joseph was a teenager, God gives him this amazing vision. Okay, so already, can you picture a guy like, like I'm picturing in my mind? Jeff, I'm, I'm thinking of Jeff in my hometown. Uh, can you picture that guy like they got everything going for them? They're so good looking. Their family's rich. Er, like everything always goes easy, easy for them. That's Joseph. And God gives him a vision that his whole family is going to one day bow down to him. So already that's bad. But when you consider in their culture, he's the young one. The, the older people don't bow down to the young people. It's always the opposite. And so he, he tells them this vision, and he's just like good-looking and happy. And he's just telling everybody, you're not going to believe this, but God told me you're all going to bow down to me. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> but they did not see it as awesome. It was just like one more thing that irritated them about him. And I don't know if you can relate to Joseph. Maybe, you know, you're the, you're the, the prize child, the golden child, maybe. Uh, or maybe, have you ever had something where you wanted your family to celebrate with you and they didn't? They just dismissed it? Or they even put you down while well, you didn't really deserve it, you didn't really work that hard, it was just a fluke, it was just luck that you got this blessing? Like, that, that doesn't feel very good. That is a trial, and that is what Joseph began to go through. Now, when he was 17, so this vision came uh, at 17 or younger. When he was 17, so the oldest brother, I don't know how much older it would be than him, probably like 20 years older or something, the, uh, the, the brothers got Joseph away from the house. They're out with the flocks. Out, meh, meh. There's all that stuff going, meh. There's all those, just the sounds, but it's just them in the desert. And they go, bro. Snitches get stitches. <laughs> and they take him and they throw him in a pit in the desert. He was really in the pits on that day. And they left him, no food, no water, in a desert pit. They left him to die. Well, that's bad. But then one of the brothers is like, oh, is there, maybe there's another way we could do it. So they go and they, they pull him out of the pit. And they, they rescue him, but they saw a caravan of slave traders that was heading to Egypt. And I think we've got a picture, an actual big picture of them. <laughs> that was, <laughs> I didn't let you see their eyes. I thought that might give it away. Um, so this caravan, they sell Joseph for 20 nickels, 20 pieces of silver, to this caravan of slave traders heading to Egypt. So that way they didn't have to kill him, but they did get rid of him. And then they tricked their dad, Jacob or Israel, into thinking he was dead. If you read the story, they don't say he died. They just go, here's a bloody coat. Could that be Joseph's? Well, there's only one coat like that. (laughs) And so Jacob goes into this grief spiral. I'm going to be grieving till I die. He's Because this is his favorite son. And he assumes, and you know what happens then. He assumes that they, that his son was, was ripped apart by live animals or whatever, you know, deadly animals. And, And, and he goes into this grief spiral. Wow, that's bad. So when the caravan gets to Egypt, they have a slave auction, and a guy named Potiphar bids and buys, bids for and buys Joseph. And Potiphar was a well-to-do guy. He actually happened to be the captain of the palace guard of the king of Egypt, the pharaoh, king pharaoh, same thing. And when he saw Joseph, he realized, okay, this is not your normal run-of-the-mill servant or slave. He looks at his skin. It's not all weathered. He, he's, he's not sunburned 
from, from doing all those outside um, uh, duties. He looks at his fingernails, and, and they look kind of like mine. Uh, there's no dirt under them. And, and he, Potiphar, he's, he's a well-to-do guy. He, he manages a large household just on his own, plus the captain, plus the, the palace guard. And he goes, okay, this is, this is a different guy. I'm getting this guy. So he buys Potiphar, brings him into his house. And now this favored son, who is used to being the slave owner, is now the slave. Can you imagine how that would have been for him? Have you ever been forced to do a job you don't like to do or that you didn't want to do? It doesn't, it doesn't feel so good. That is a trial. And in this, Joseph lost everything. He lost his nation. He lost his people. He lost his family. He lost his status. He lost his possessions. He lost his money. He lost his freedom. He lost his rights. This is a bad, bad trial that he is going through. Have you ever been through a season of loss? I have. It does not feel that great. And that's what Joseph was experiencing. But God. So Joseph's now in this house. He's a slave. And he's, he's brought to this house, and he begins to do his work. And the Potiphar, the owner, he begins to realize, wow, this is a special guy. And before long... God prospered his house. So where they used to have one lamb born in the spring, now they had 10 lambs born in the spring. It was God prospered the house, gave enough water for their crops. Like God was obviously with them. And Joseph began to tell Potiphar and the other people around him, I serve the one true God. I serve the one true God. And the Bible says Potiphar noticed, I can tell. I can tell you you serve the one true God, and God's blessing you and blessing me. And before long, Potiphar made Joseph his right-hand man, the second in charge. So Joseph goes from being a slave sold by his brothers to being in, uh, second in, in command. He was in charge of Potiphar's household, the, the other servants, the crops, the buying, the selling. He was in charge there. Now, really interesting who God put him with. Because Joseph is now learning the language and customs of the elite leaders of Egypt. Interesting. He, he, is, he, he has a, a firsthand mentor. He's learning about leadership in general because this man is a leader. But then Joseph faces one of the hardest trials of his life. Remember the Bible description of how he looked? Well, Potiphar's wife notices Mm, looking fine. <laughs> Little slave in my house. And so she began to proposition him. And she began to say, let's get it on. Let's put on some Barry White and let's go. <laughs> and, the, and she just began every day to just begin hounding him. So I don't know about you, but I, I'm familiar with the story, and I often kind of focus on the wrong that she was doing. It's like she was, she was harassing him, and I always focus on that, but I forget this was a sexual temptation for him. Picture uh, Joseph. So he's 17, 18, 19 by this time. He's kind of at that marriage, you know, marrying age. And he has no family. He's not already married. He has no wife to be faithful to. He has no public following. Like, he could maybe get away with this. And really, no one would know. Like, obviously, the wife's not going to tell because she's pursuing. No one knows me. No one cares about me. I, it's not like I grew up in this town. Like, I have no reputation. I'm a nobody. I could maybe get away, get away with this. This is a severe and intense sexual temptation. Have you ever had a sexual temptation that you maybe could have got away with? And how did you react? That's a trial. That is a test. In Genesis 39, 8 and 9, we see what Joseph did. And he fought off this temptation with respect. It's really an interesting strategy. Verse 8, but Joseph refused 
when she asked him day after day. He said, look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. So he respected his master. He said, no one here has more authority than I do. He respected himself. He said, he is, uh, my master has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. He remembered her position and he respected her. How could I do such a wicked thing, he said. It would be a great sin against God. And he respected God. Isn't it interesting that in this case, Joseph fought off sexual temptation with respect. Very, very cool strategy. But Potiphar's wife would not give up. She's a leader. She is an elite. She's in, you know, the social clubs. She is used to getting what she wanted to get. And so she, uh, Joseph kept avoiding her, but she just would not relent. And one day, just happened to be no one was around. Everyone's out in the fields or whatever. She grabs him by the coat and says, come sleep with me. He ran away. He was already prepared for this situation. He ran away, and in the process, she, she, she kept his coat. She was holding it, and he, like, got out of the coat and ran. And she used that coat, and she lied about him. And she said, see this coat? This is the man who came to attack me. And she lied. And the, her husband, when, when Potiphar came home, he was furious. He, he immediately put Joseph in jail. Now, this is interesting to me. He did not kill him. I am guessing Potiphar took one look in his face and went, you didn't do it. But now this is public. I got to put you in jail. And he knew what his, like, what, what his wife was like. This is probably not a big surprise to him, so he puts him in jail. And in this situation, Joseph, he had no rights, no trial. He's a foreigner. He's uh, brought as a slave into this country. And he learned that sometimes you just got to shut up and let God take care of you because there was no one to talk to. <laughs> there was nothing he could do. All I could do was talk to God. So th he's there in prison. And God, again, God prospered Joseph. He prospered him in the, in the prison, and the, the warden, the, the chief uh, guy there in command of the prison, saw that. And so he put him in charge. He made him his right-hand man. This is the second time. He made him his right-hand man, and God prospered. Things went well in the jail, and while he's there, Joseph is learning how to deal with and lead various kinds of people. Before long, the kings, the pharaohs, top two officials landed in that very jail interesting. And they told Joseph, it's written down in Genesis 40, verse 8, we both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. So Joseph's kind of in charge there, and they tell him, we had these dreams, we don't know what they mean. This is what he says, interpreting dreams is God's business, Joseph replied. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. I know God. I serve God. You tell me, and God will take care of it. So God gave Joseph the interpretation of the dream. And the, just to make a long story short, he tells one of them, you're going to be acquitted. Uh, you're going to get out of here and be declared innocent. The other one, you're going to be executed. And that's exactly what happened. And the one that lived was the cupbearer. And he said, when you get out to Pharaoh, would you please put a good word in for me? Because I do not deserve to be in this prison. I did not commit a crime. And here I am against my will. Guess what? He forgot. It was two years when all of a sudden, two years later, the pharaoh has this, these two strange dreams. And the cupbearer went, oh, that's right, I forgot. I was supposed to say something about the dream interpreter in prison. So he does, though, and he pulls, pulls Joseph out and brings him into the palace. Pharaoh says, I've had these dreams, tells him about it. And in uh, Genesis 41, 16, Joseph again says, it is beyond my power to do this, Joseph replied. Now, when Joseph was 17... I bet he would have said, you know what? I'm all about the dreams. I'll tell you what your dreams mean, sir. He is not doing that anymore. Now he says, God is in charge of dreams, and I serve God. And so Pharaoh told, Pharaoh told him his dreams. Uh, verse 25, Joseph responded, both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he's about to do. Seven years of abundance are coming for this land. Crops are going to be booming, but then seven years of famine are going to come after that. It's going to be bad. It's the, it's, the economy is going to tank. Uh, uh, wow. Uh, yeah, 
that hurts a little. Uh, and so he said, Joseph said to the Pharaoh, I recommend you just find a really wise man to just be in charge and let's and like store up this grain and, and prepare for the future. And Pharaoh said, you the man. <laughs> Joseph is 30. And for the third time, becomes second in command. But now it's of the country of Egypt. And so it, crops are booming, and Joseph goes, and, and he, you know, he, he takes care of all that stuff. Pharaoh gave him his, his robe. He got a new one. He gave him his ring, and he provided a wife for him. In that culture, that would be kind of how it would be done, like I'm providing a bride for you. And in verse, uh, same chapter, Genesis 41, 51 to 52, it says that God gave Joseph two sons. Now, in the Bible times, and especially in this era, man, they named their sons like whatever they were feeling. So like there's this one lady that, that named her child, I'm wasting away, <laughs> you know, uh, I'm practically dead. Like they would name their kid, come in, practically dead, come in for dinner. Well, Joseph didn't do that. He named his kids um, uh, I gotta find it here. Manasseh, his older one, for for this means God has made me forget all my troubles, and everyone in my father's family. In other words, God has 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 redeemed it. He's made me forget my troubles. And then his second son Ephraim, he said, because God has made me fruitful in this land of my grief. So he's giving God praise through the the names he gave his sons. So I want to come back to where I started. What is the connection? between crazy trials and courageous faith because all of the people we've studied so far have gone through crazy trials. Do trials cause faith to grow? Well, 1 Peter in the New Testament, chapter 1, verses 6 to 9, talks about this. And as I, as I read these verses, these, uh, just a, a few verses here, uh, would you join me and look for three connections between faith and trials? Okay, look for three connections between trials and developing faith. So verse 6, so be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. And Peter was writing to the early church that was being persecuted. So like we're talking trials. Verse 7, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests. So a first connection I see is that trials prove your faith. Trials prove your faith. We're looking for a connection between trials and faith. Trials prove your faith. Despite all the rejection, loss, temptation, frustrating circumstances, Joseph trusted God. The, the severe trials that Joseph went through proved that his faith was genuine. He was not just a guy you know, who went to the worship gathering and yawned his way through. Like he believed in God. His faith was in God. And it showed because he honored God. He prayed to God. He obeyed God. He shared God with unbelievers. He trusted God. He had courageous faith. When you go through hard times, through trials, through temptations, through tests, the status of of your faith is revealed. It is your faith is shown as fake or real. I'm going to go on here. Uh, the same chapter, First Peter one seven. If your faith is being tested, uh, it rather it your faith is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So a second connection, trials purify your faith. What does pure mean? Pure means unmixed, solid, one thing. And so like, like pure gold is more beautiful and valuable than gold, say, mixed with a little bit of iron, a little bit of copper, or whatever. Pure gold is beautiful. It's valuable. Your faith becomes more beautiful and more valuable when it's tried, when you go through hard, hard times. And when you choose in the middle of a hard time to believe, trust, and commit to obey, that's our definition of faith, your faith is purified. It's undiluted. It does not waver. 
it is not mixed with doubt. Your faith is not on again, off again, on again, off again, because you've gone, you're going through trials and you're allowing it to purify your faith. That's what Joseph did. He could have just walked away from God. He didn't. He actually got closer to God. And he waited 13 years in slavery and prison. 13 years. And we, I, I, I'm just going to say, I complain when it's been a year and my thing wasn't answered and I've not been to jail and I've not been sold into slavery by my family. Wow. Trials purify your faith and they prove your faith. And then the last part uh, for, uh, in 1 Peter 1, when, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You know, we always talk about we're, we're going to praise the Lord. The Lord is going to praise you for your faith. It's going to bring you praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him. You love Jesus, even though you've never seen him. And though you do not see him now, you trust him. And skipping down to verse 9, the reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. Doesn't this give you a different perspective about hard times you're going through? And I, the final, uh, final connection I see is that your trial refined faith will be rewarded. Your trial refined faith will be rewarded. Isn't that good? So hang in there. You will, when you see Jesus face to face, you'll be rewarded. You will receive God's praise, his like accolades, his good job, and his glory and honor. And you will receive your full salvation. You know, we are saved if you put your faith in Jesus, but we are also being saved. We're being saved from sin. We're, we are being saved from this body of flesh and all the sinful choices. We're being saved, but the, the reward for your faith when you persevere through hard trials, we got something at the end. It's praise, honor, and glory. And you're going to have a reward for your faith when you see Jesus face to face. In Matthew 25, 21, it's written that Jesus will say to you, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. Let's celebrate together. Jesus is going to say that to you. Isn't that awesome? Like, I cannot wait for that. That is going to be fantastic. So is it possible to develop courageous faith without having to go through crazy trials? Can you get faith a little easier way? <laughs> without going through crazy trials, that's what we want. We want the easy way. Is there another way? Well, let's just say that God usually tries your faith before you're promoted in him not at your job at work, before you are trusted with greater responsibility in the kingdom of God, your faith is usually tried. And do you notice with Joseph, three different times, he became second in command over a little household, over a big old prison, and then over a country. He was tested. And at each of those places, man, hard things, hard hard sexual temptation, no rights, sitting in a jail, a hard, hard test. But in all those situations, his faith stayed strong in God Almighty. Now, is it possible to go through crazy trials, especially as a believer, and not develop courageous faith? Yes, it is. Because it matters how you show up in that trial, in that difficulty. If you blame and curse God for your trial and for your hard times, you might just be burned up by that trial. Instead of being purified in that trial. Two people, two followers of Jesus can go through the same trial and come out differently on the other side. Uh, and there's a, a, a 
vintage author A.W. Tozer that said, what you believe or what you think about God is the most important thing about you. What you believe about God, what you think about God is the most important thing about you. So in your trial, what do you think about God? Are you saying, God, you're not doing a good job? God, you're messing up? God, you're mean? God, you must be angry? That's what you think about God. That is the most important thing about you, and it determines who you're going to be on the other side of your hard times. If instead you're saying, and what you think about God is, God, you're enough. God, you are love. God, you got my best interests in mind. God, you're for me. God, your promises are always going to come true. God, you got a reward ahead of me. God, it's worth it to serve you because you are loving and you are caring. If that's your thought about God, that changes how you come out on the other side of your trial. Will you allow yourself to get broken or bitter or better? How will you face your trial? Would you stand to your feet? Would you stand to your feet, everybody? And let's pray. If you're online, would you just make where you are a place of prayer also? And let's just do this together. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, I just pray that you would give us courageous faith. I'm kind of scared. I don't want to ask for trials and temptations and tests, but I do want courageous faith. And I know that whatever is filtered through your hand, you're going to make a way for me and for us to endure and to, to succeed and to come out on the other side purified, proven, and rewarded. And I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for that, Lord. With your head still bowed, I just want to ask you, are you going through a trial? Are you going through a test? Are you going through a hard time? Maybe you've been going through a hard time for years. Maybe a hard time just started. Are you going through a hard time? Can I just see your hand? And online, would you just raise your hand to God just to say, God, it's, uh, it's hard. Yes, I'm going through some hard things. Many, many, many hands. I just want to pray for you. That's all. I just want to pray for you. Lord, you see those who raise their hand. Lord, I know, Lord, I know, Lord, I know, Lord, I know, I just pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would be there. God is for me. God's got me. If God's for me, who could be against me? It doesn't matter. God is purifying me. God is pu proving my faith. God is only doing good things. God is causing all the bad things to work together for my good. I'm going to be rewarded one day. Lord God, help us. Help us, Lord God, to trust you and to talk this way and to think this way and to pray this way. Lord, right in the middle of a big old trial, Lord, I pray you'd help us to say no to sexual temptation. Lord God, right in the middle of a big old trial, I pray you'd help us to point our employer to Jesus. Uh, help us to point our neighbor to Jesus. Help us to point our unsaved family member to Jesus, even though we're going through a trial, because our faith is not going to waver. Our faith is not going to waver. Our faith is in you, Lord. Not in my ability to, to endure the trial. Not in my ability. It's in you, Lord. Our faith is in you. We love you. We praise you. And Lord, I just pray every, that you would help every person to endure if enduring is what we need. Lord, we don't want to get out of the trial quickly until we learn that lesson or until our faith is proven or our faith is purified because you are doing a good thing in that way. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. When we walk through the flames, we will not be burned up. When you go through the flood, you will not drown. Because the Lord says, I am with you. I am with you. I have called you by name. I know you. I have redeemed you. You are not alone. You are not alone. With your head still bowed, I just want to give you one more invitation to prayer. I want to pray for you.
if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. We're talking about faith. Let's get some, sa some saving faith in you. How do you do that? Turn away from your sin. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead you. Are you ready to do that right now? The whole church is praying for you right now, hoping that you will. Whether you're online or in the room, it doesn't matter. If today's your day to put your faith in Jesus to become a Christian, would you just raise your hand? And by that, you're just saying, pray for me, Pastor. I want to put my faith in Jesus right now. That's good. Awesome. Yep, God's doing something in people's lives right now. That is fantastic. Would you just pray for uh, uh, pray with me? I'm just going to coach you in a prayer. Uh, with the people around you, would you just pray aloud right now? Let's do it. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice starting now. And I put my faith in you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we just, we're excited. That's awesome. Would you just let me know? I really want to know if you put your faith in Jesus today. If I fill out the Connect card, hopefully you already started it earlier. And just check one of the boxes at the bottom. And that just, let, that'll let me know. And we're going to rejoice with you. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Garen. What a great, just such a, probably the most relevant word we've heard. <laughs> We're all going through something. And how we come out on the other end, are, are we going to grow in faith or are we going to stay the same? Yeah, I want to grow in faith. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, um, everything else has gone from my mind now. So, Connect card. Oh, yeah. The ushers will be coming down the aisles right now to collect Connect cards. Um, if you have those, if you have any prayer requests, be sure to put them in the bucket. Also, tonight is our volunteer appreciation dinner. Yeah! Just a time for us to celebrate all our volunteers. Um, so if you could please volunteer and um, help set, a, set up this area. Um, we're going to put out eight tables out here. Um, that would be great. We need a lot more people than usual to help out this time and then also um oh yeah if you haven't rsvp'd yet for the volunteer appreciation dinner and you've been invited please rsvp so that we know that you're coming all right it's so good to see you god bless you we love you have a great week